It's December 2007. In Hawaii, Howard Schultz is pacing his room before dawn. He's been up all night. One thought keeps going through his mind. Starbucks is failing itself. At breakfast, his wife Sherry gives him a worried look. Howard, please eat something. I can't. No appetite. He's always savored his family's Christmas holiday in Hawaii. This is when he and Sherry and their kids take time to reconnect. But now, Sherry is alarmed. Howard is so miserable and distracted. He pushes his breakfast plate away, gets up from the table, and goes to his computer. The email he's been expecting has arrived. Sherry watches as he reads it, then puts his face in his hands. She hurries over to him. What does it say? I can't believe what I'm seeing. The sales at each of our stores are way down from what they were a year ago. They're in free fall. Howard, every business has its ups and downs. But Starbucks isn't just a business for me. It's who I am. Right. And look at all you've done. You've established Starbucks as a progressive, kind employer. You've made it a gathering place that draws people together. Yeah, but the numbers are telling a different story. We've got fewer people coming into the stores, Sherry, and when they do, they spend less time in them. I just don't know how to turn this around. Schultz is momentarily lost in thought. Then he glances up at Sherry. You know... Not long ago when our stock was doing well, one of my executives told me I was making people too rich. The investors believed the upswing wouldn't end. I thought that was great at the time, but but it's our success that led us to failure. That doesn't make sense. What do you mean? I mean we fixated on the bottom line and took our customers for granted. I think that's why we're bleeding. Well, then you've got to do something about it. But I don't think there's any point in casting blame or pointing fingers. I agree. Anyway, there's no time for that. Our stock and sales are plummeting too quickly. I've just got to find the solution. And I have to find it now. Dunkin' Donuts isn't going to wait for us to figure this out. The answer forms slowly in his mind before it becomes crystal clear. What Schultz does next is unprecedented. It will open him up to ridicule and catch everyone off guard, including his own team. But finally, he knows exactly what he must do. Go back to square one. From Wondery, I'm David Brown and this is Business Wars. In the last episode, Howard Schultz realized his dream of turning Starbucks into a booming upscale espresso business. And a regrettable spending spree at Dunkin' Donuts led to a corporate takeover. Now, with Starbucks stock steadily slipping, Schultz worries there's a takeover target on his company's back. He needs to turn things around, but with the economy flashing danger signs, things are about to get worse before they get better. This is Episode 4, Trouble is Brewing. It's the first Sunday night of 2008. A cold rain is falling in Seattle. Just two days ago, Howard Schultz held a secret meeting with the company's CEO, Jim McDonald. Now, Schultz is at home preparing to make an announcement. His assistant calls the leadership team. Howard wants you to come to his house at 9 p.m. tonight. Uh, Why? What's happening? I can't tell you, and please don't tell anyone about this call. Why are you being so mysterious? You'll find out when you get there. Schultz hears the wheels of a car crunching on the stones of his driveway. One by one, the team arrives. There's the chief financial officer, the chief operating officers, 
and the senior leaders responsible for everything from store operations and marketing to legal affairs. As each man and woman descends the steps into the living room, they're surprised to see other team members. The mood is subdued, the conversation minimal. They sit on big armchairs and couches, trading wary glances. At 9 p.m. sharp, Schultz strides into the room and stands as he addresses his team. I'll get straight to the point. As of yesterday, the current CEO, Jim McDonald, has left the company. I'm coming back as CEO, effective tomorrow. Everyone is silent. Schultz is Starbucks founder and chairman of the board. It's clear his reinstatement is not up for discussion. The next morning, on January 7, 2008, the public learns that Schultz is returning as CEO. Schultz drives along Seattle's hilly streets. After so much turmoil, he feels a need to connect with his Starbucks roots, to remember the feelings that brought him to the coffee business in the first place. So he's making a sentimental journey to the company's flagship store, half a block from its original location. He takes his personal key from his pocket and opens the door. The shop is dark. The gleaming espresso machine is still. The rich scent of coffee beans fills the air. He's struck by how quiet it is. As he runs his hand over the original wooden counter, he feels three decades of history beneath his fingertips. Behind this counter, he learned to make espresso as a young man. It brings back a rush of memories, particularly of the confidence he had back then, back in the days before he knew how much could go wrong for Starbucks. He's going to need some of that old confidence now to turn things around. He takes a last look around and leaves the darkened store. Hours later, back in his office, Schultz watches his top staff silently file into the conference room, defeat in their downcast eyes and slumped shoulders. It seems to him they're embarrassed they've let the company slide. Standing at the head of the conference table, he takes a deep breath. If there was ever a time to rally the troops, it's now. I just need one thing from you, and that is to fix the house, because the house is on fire. There's silence in the room. Everyone waits anxiously for Schultz to go on. Here's the problem. We've been playing by the wrong rules. We've been so focused on not disappointing investors that we've lost sight of who's really important, our customers. Around the table, the team's eyes are glued on Schultz. He takes a deep breath. But here's the thing. I am absolutely confident that we'll turn this company around. It's going to be hard, and I'm going to ask more of you than has ever been asked before. You need to ask yourself whether you believe in Starbucks, whether you have faith in it. Because if you don't, you can leave right now. No hard feelings. I'm not leaving, Howard. Neither am I. I'm in. Schultz finally sees a flicker of fire in their eyes. It's a start. That afternoon, Schultz is alone in his office. On his bookshelf, he keeps a small crystal ball. It's not doing him much good at the moment. And on a nearby table, there's a bottle of Mazagran, a failed Starbucks product from the 1990s, an ill-advised hybrid of coffee and soda. He keeps it there to remind himself that the company isn't invincible. Not that he needs much reminding of that now. He paces the room. His eye catches a front page story in today's Wall Street Journal. The headline reads, McDonald's takes on a weakened Starbucks. The fast food chain is adding baristas and coffee bars, making a play to poach his customers. But he knows it's Dunkin' Donuts that poses the toughest challenge. They plan to more than double their U.S. stores to 15,000 in the next 10 years by pushing into the South and Southwest. Schultz can hardly believe that for all Starbucks quality and sophistication, its fiercest competitor is the humble Dunkin' Donuts. And that's for a very simple reason. 
Of all the coffee companies out there, Dunkin' Donuts is ranked number one in customer loyalty for the second year in a row. And Dunkin' isn't letting up. A week after his return as CEO was announced, Schultz calls his leadership team into his office. They're hoping for a sign or something that will tell them how to douse the house fire. But they're not prepared for what's coming. Schultz doesn't waste any time. The quality of our espresso is slipping. Our baristas need to make perfect espresso. And they don't. Some pour it too fast so it's weak. Others pour it too slow so it's bitter. We have to retrain them. How can you retrain 135,000 baristas? There's only one way. Give them a training course. It would require us to close all our stores for a few hours. But we do it towards the end of the day to minimize disruption. That's a big idea. No large retailer has done anything like it. And for good reason. Closing stores, even for three or four hours, means losing several million dollars in sales. Won't Dunkin' Donuts jump at the chance to steal our customers looking for a fix? Even so, Starbucks is nothing without a perfect cup of coffee. Schultz sits back in his chair. He turns to his team. Let's do it. Days later, CNNMoney.com carries this story. Warning to Starbucks junkies who usually get a fix on their way home from work, you're out of luck on Tuesday. Starbucks plans to temporarily close its 7,100 U.S. stores on Tuesday for three hours of employee training. At Dunkin' Donuts, the news is greeted with laughter. The leadership team sees an opportunity. They're admitting they've got a problem with their coffee, so let's take advantage of it. How about this? We'll announce that when Starbucks closes, we'll offer small lattes, cappuccinos, or espresso drinks for a special price of 99 cents. And we'll put out a statement saying, Dunkin' Donuts will ensure that no coffee lover is denied a delicious espresso-based beverage. On February 26th at 5.30 p.m., Starbucks customers are politely asked to leave each of the company's 7,100 stores. Excuse me, sir, we're, we're closing up. What? Hey, hey, I just bought my coffee. What's going on here? With the doors locked behind them, the baristas wearing Starbucks caps and dark green aprons over their street clothes take their seats. They're shown a hastily prepared video that's been shipped to the stores along with 7,100 DVD players. The narrator explains how to make perfect espresso. Finally, Schultz appears on the screen. It's not about the company or the brand. It's about you. You decide whether or not the espresso you pour is good enough. You have my complete support and my faith and belief in you. Let's measure our actions by that perfect shot of espresso. That night, Starbucks is a huge media story. One New York City newspaper runs the headline, Starbucks shutdown is a grande pain for New Yorkers. The coffee wars continue to brew, brew, brew. Starbucks closing its doors for three hours later today to retrain its employees. Dunkin' Donuts responding by offering their specialty coffees for 99 cents during that time. At home, Schultz flips on Stephen Colbert's mock news report about his three miserable hours without a caffeinated drink. It ends with Colbert dousing himself in the shower with coffee, foam, and cinnamon. For the first time in months, Schultz goes to sleep laughing. But it's not so funny when he learns that closing the stores has cost Starbucks six million dollars. Schultz has a message for his top brass. We paid a price for the closures, but if that means we're serving great coffee again, the losses are 100% worth it. Yet, Starbucks troubles are far from over. In April, They cut expenses by $150 million, but there's more pain to come. Arthur Rubenfeld, the senior vice president for store development, delivers the bad news to Schultz. I hate to say this, but we're oversaturated. We've got more stores than we can support in this economy. So I believe we need to close 200 stores. What? Why? We've already canceled the opening of 348 stores. We're not meeting the two-to-one ratio. That ratio is key to Starbucks' business model. During its first year, a new store needs to bring in $2 for every $1 invested 
to cover the design and lease expenses. But in the midst of a recession, expensive coffee is seen as a luxury. People just aren't buying it the way they once did. Schultz takes a deep breath. He slumps in his chair. This is even worse than canceling those store openings. That was a necessary correction. This feels like a defeat. But by July, it's clear that even more stores need to be closed. The final number is huge. 600. That's 8% of Starbucks' retail portfolio. When the company also announces they'll be opening 200 new stores the following year, the media has a field day. What this is, is an admission of a mistake. Basically Mm. what they're saying is, you know what, we opened up too many stores in too many places that we shouldn't have, so we've got to retrace our steps now, shut all those suckers down before we can open up some new ones. And once again, Stephen Colbert takes his shot at the coffee giant. Damn you, mom and pop coffee stores, (laughs) for forcing Starbucks out of business. Now that I'm not spending $4 a cup, what am I supposed to do with that extra money? Buy a Joni Mitchell CD? (laughs) Oh, wait, I can't. All the Starbucks are closing. As news spreads of their plans, the stock tanks, trading at its lowest level since 2003. Then come the layoffs. Globally, Starbucks fires 12,000 workers. That's 7% of its global workforce. After everything Schultz has done to fix the company, he's right back to where he was in Hawaii a year ago. Those massive layoffs are keeping him up at night. What's next, he wonders. How much worse can this get? The answer will come from a taste test. We get support from Avalara. You know, nobody goes into business because they want to collect sales tax. It's just something businesses of all sizes have to do, right? Well, to add insult to injury, it's pretty complicated. There are more than 12,000 tax jurisdictions in the U.S. alone. You combine that with the thousands of product taxability rules, and what you wind up with is a massive headache for businesses trying to make sense of it all. That is where Avalara can help you. Avalara is tax compliance done right. Their software automatically calculates the right amount of tax that should be charged for every product in every transaction— all in the blink of an eye. Plus, Avalara files all of the sales tax returns wherever and whenever they're due and manages the piles of documentation digitally. And when businesses sell across international borders, there's a whole other level of complexity, right? But once again, Avalara experts in offices in 15 countries around the world are ready to help businesses navigate compliance challenges as they grow and reach new regions. Look, it's time to get Avalara. You can find out more at avalara.com slash BW. That's A-V-A-L-A-R-A dot com slash BW. May 2008, Cleveland. 20 people sit at a long counter in a test kitchen. They range in age from late teens to mid-sixties. They trade quizzical glances, unsure what to expect. Dunkin' Donuts has commissioned a two-month nationwide taste test that pits Dunkin' Donuts' original blend against Starbucks' house blend. More than 400 randomly selected coffee drinkers will weigh in. As the testers wait, Four technicians wearing lab coats brew the coffee using the equipment recommended by each brand. Each tester gets two cups of black coffee with numbers marked on them. One cup contains Starbucks brew. Cup two is Dunkin' Donuts. The testers sip. They sip again, tasting one brand, then the other. They write the cup number of their preferred coffee on the card in front of them. The final result... 54% prefer Dunkin' Donuts coffee, compared with 39% who choose Starbucks. 6% express no preference. Another blow to Starbucks, which claims its coffee is indisputably the best. Soon after, Schultz picks up his hometown paper, the Seattle Post-Intelligencer. His eyes widen as he reads, Dunkin' Donuts has a message for Starbucks. 
Game on. They're running an ad that urges, try the coffee that won and see why America really does run on Duncan. Adding insult to injury, McDonald's website touts itself as unsnobbycoffee.com. Days later, Schultz is driving along the freeway when he sees a billboard ad for McDonald's coffee. It reads, four bucks is dumb, now serving espresso. A minute later, he passes another that reads, large is the new grande. There's no doubt about it. The coffee wars are blazing, and everyone's gun is aimed squarely at Starbucks. Howard Schultz storms into his office. He summons his top people. We've got to get on the offensive. I want an aggressive ad campaign. His team exchanged curious glances. Schultz had always shunned advertising. Finally, one pipes up. You've always said Starbucks' success is built on its interactions with its customers. That was then. Now we've got a fight on our hands. We're being squeezed from the bottom by fast food brands like McDonald's and Dunkin' Donuts and from the top by high-end independent coffee shops. We can't be caught in the middle. So we've got to respond. Right now. Given Schultz's sense of urgency, the ad agency decides to hook the ad to the next big public event, the upcoming presidential election that pits Barack Obama against John McCain. On October 31, 2008, five days before the election, management views Starbucks's first ever ad. It's unusual, distinctive. There are no spoken words, just light piano music and green type rolling on a screen. It reads, If you care enough to vote, Starbucks cares enough to give you a free cup of coffee. Come into Starbucks on November 4th, Tell us you voted, and we'll proudly give you a tall cup of brewed coffee on us. You and Starbucks. It's bigger than coffee. This is perfect. Now we've got to find the right commercial slots and figure out if we can afford them. And we've got to make sure we have enough coffee to handle the traffic overflow. We've got four days to get this together. The next day, they place their ad on Saturday Night Live. After it airs, it's posted on social media. The ad goes viral. It's seen by 89 million people. Election Day, 2008. Schultz votes in the morning, then hurries to a nearby Starbucks. The store is bustling. There are students wearing jeans and parkas, business people in stylish suits, young men and women in running clothes stopping off for a free cup of java on their way to the gym. The air is electric. People are chatting, high-fiving, checking their phones for news. They all have a small oval sticker on their clothes that reads, I voted. Schultz calls his wife. I wish you could see this. It's about more than the free coffee. Starbucks is a gathering place again. We're exactly what we set out to be. But his high is short-lived. Days after the election... Starbucks is accused of violating election laws by offering something of value in exchange for voting. To avoid legal tussles, the company extends the offer of free tall coffee to anyone who requests it. But there's something else going on. By the end of 2008, the economy is crumbling, and it doesn't play favorites. Both Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts are taking it on the chin. Hard-pressed Americans have taken matters into their own hands. They're making coffee at home. In our next episode, Dunkin' Donuts gets a tough new sheriff who insists on pushback, and Howard Schultz has an instant revelation. Revelation.